This is Catalog and Cocktails. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Here's your hosts, Juan Cicada and Tim Gasper. Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is a very unusual episode as far as this whole series goes. I feel like this needs to be kind of like, uh, you know, live from New York at Saturday night, live from Austin, Texas, Data Our World HQ. It's Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> so you've got uh, um, the folks from Catalog and Cocktails here. It's your honest, no BS, non salesy conversation about enterprise data management live coming to you. Um, and uh, I'm Tim Gasper, product guy and longtime data nerd joined by my co-host Juan. But we're always live, except that this time we're not just, besides being live, we're actually in person. Right. This is uh, episode 48. Uh, Catalog and Cocktails started as some idea experiment uh, because of the pandemic. And this is the first time we are here finally live in person. Finally, great. I can't, I've been, wait, I've been waiting for this real moment. people. We <laughs> promise. <laughs> so uh, I'm Juan Cicada, principal scientist here at data.world. And it is a pleasure always to take a break in the middle of the week and, and chat about data. And today we get to chat, not just about data, but we get to chat about knowledge mm -hmm. and who best to chat about knowledge with Joe Hilger, who is uh, one of the, the chief operating officer of enterprise knowledge. Joe, how are you doing? Good, Juan and Tim. Thank you for having me here. I've listened to your podcast before and love them. You guys do a great job. Well, thank you. Thank you. And just a quick reminder, please give us a review on Apple, Podca Apple Podcast. Uh, follow us on Spotify, all those good things. Uh, we really appreciate uh, our loyal listeners and everybody. Uh, I mean, we're getting emails, which is so cool. It's like, hey, I've been listening to the podcast and stuff. So it's, it's really, really exciting. And thanks to everybody who who, who listens, but especially the audience who's actually here live every week. So we really, really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. So what are we drinking and what are we going to toast for? So yeah, Joe, what do you got going on? And then we'll chime in. So, and I, I got to take this from home. So I got to pick my favorite little Macallan 12 scotch. Um, as we were talking about before this, nice and smooth and easy. Juan, Tim, how about you two? So because we're at our office and uh, we had to raid the, the bar in the office, which is kind of empty. So I have here a uh, scotch, which I've never had before, the Strathcombe. And uh, I've pretty, I've always been very diligent to actually make a drink. So it's not just the neat drink. So I'm, I'm doing this mix with like Yerba Buena uh, and it's, it's okay. <laughs> I love Juan's dedication because he's like, I can't just drink it straight. I've never drinking anything straight yeah, on this yeah, podcast. Yeah, right? yeah. How about you, Tim? What are you doing? What are you drinking? So I, I, I cheated. Uh, I've done this a few times where I drank something neat. Uh, I feel like it counts. It's a cocktail with nothing in it. Um, so we got uh, Old Forester here, single barrel. Found this in the uh, the Data Dot World cabinet and uh, just taking a little sip of that neat. It's not bad. And definitely, we're toasting for being in person. Uh, and I think I'm looking forward to start being in person with more people. You and too, Joe. Cheers, cheers, Joe. We'll be in person with you very soon. Looking forward to it. So we got our, our warm-up question. Uh, what is one of the what what is one piece of knowledge that you know now that you wish you knew when you were younger? Who wants to Yeah, you know, I uh, thought about this and and uh, it struck me as I was I was growing up, uh, sharing your accomplishments. Right. When I was first in the working world, I would I would put my head down and do a great job. And well, why don't they recognize I'm doing a great job? And and what I what I realized is, as as I got older, that you have to tell people what you do, that people are busy and understand it. And, you know, um, when I work with our younger consultants at Enterprise Knowledge, you know, we're up to 70 people now. And a lot of them are just starting out in their career. And for a lot of them, they want to be humble and modest. And that's great and that's fine, but there's, there's another part to this, which is your manager is busy, your clients are busy. Letting them know what you accomplished is, is helpful and important. And it's not bragging, et cetera, but it was something I had to learn in time. And it took me, took me a while to, to learn that and, and something I'm trying to spend time with our many young consultants for them to hear that message that it's okay to say what you did. So that, that, that's great. I think you're all, and you're also kind of going ahead about uh, the, the advice question we always ask folks. So you have to have another good advice question. Uh, okay. I had a, quite an answer for the advice question. Um, one thing I had was thinking about is appreciate your history. 
I think as a, I remember as a kid, like you learn about history, uh, U.S. history, world history, and you're like, ah, history, whatever. I'm like, if I, I, I love to go back in time and, and, and take advantage of those when I was younger and learn about history and always ask why, always ask why. Yeah. That's what I would tell myself. Juan, if oh, you, you can... Tim. Oh, go ahead, Tim. Oh, go ahead, Joe, and then I'll jump in. I was going to say, Juan, if you get a chance, Ron Cherno just wrote a great uh, biography of Grant. Okay, cool. Amazing hmm. and very relevant today. You'll read stuff and go, oh my gosh, there's a lot of similar things going on. So uh, a new look at a person that you didn't know the same way. So if you're looking for reading, that's an option. How about you, Tim? I really like the answers that you guys gave, and it makes me want to revise my answer because I felt like yours was a little deeper than mine. Mine was just, uh, I would, uh, I, I could see myself telling my younger self, hey, you know, you're going to be really into this thing called software product management, and uh, you should get into that sooner. You can get a 10-year jump on, uh, on, <laughs> on, on the Tim 1.0. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, yeah. All right, well, let's actually dive into the whole topic of today about knowledge management, and, and I always like to kick off the discussion Joe, honest, no BS question. I want your honest, no BS answer. What the heck is knowledge management? <laughs> so I can't use the one we have on our website and the blog post, right? Well, no, go ahead and admit that that's probably a BS no, no, one. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's, let's cut it short and, and say it right. Um, organizations uh, have tons of information and people don't have access to that information the way they need that. And when we talk about information, it is documents, content, policies, uh, data, et cetera, right? But getting that information to people so that they can make smart, informed decisions and, and be more effective is, is really what knowledge management's about. And it's, it's, it's not just a technology problem. It's a people process and content issue as well. Um, but, it, but it is, there's a ton of technology to it, and that's definitely what, what excites me. So... Uh, getting people the right information at the point of need. So, I like how you said it's information. Actually, one word that you used right now that stood out was policy. So it's, I think if we think about it, it's it's not just about, hell, if it's documents and tables and stuff, but there's like a lot more, just not context, but very specific, like how do we do things? Like what's the process that we go do things? Uh, what are the policies what people can do and not do and stuff like all of this stuff is things that we need to go manage. And that's like the know-how that can be written down, that can be in people's head and so forth. And that's the stuff we need to go manage. So that's Absolutely. how I'm interpreting your answer. Yeah, and it's, it's tying it together. Uh, too many organizations are document-centric. They're creating documents. And you know how fun is it? Hey, I need to understand something. Well, let me go search and find the document and then get to read the document to understand what's in it, right? We're in an environment where people expect to be able to pick up their phone ask an English language question and get an answer, not a document. So right. that's breaking down that old document and content paradigm is pretty important to doing this the right way. That's super interesting. And you know, your definition of knowledge management resonates a lot and it's, it's pretty broad, right? It's, it, you're hitting kind of a broad spectrum of, of possibility there. I know that some people get confused about knowledge management and even a former, you know, my personal self where I was a little confused about knowledge management. And like, I know sometimes you can think of it as like, oh, maybe it's kind of like library science or like, or maybe it's kind of like, uh, oh, creating a wiki in your organization and capturing that knowledge, right? Like, and then there's data management, right? Data management versus knowledge management. Um, how do you approach those that, you know, disambiguating these different concepts? How do you see them as either similar or overlapping or, or different? Yeah. You know, Tim, you're, you're spot on to what knowledge management was probably five to 10 years ago. It was a lot of taxonomists creating taxonomies to organize information. And many of them were library scientists. But um, a few things have happened. One, we've got these cool things called knowledge graphs, which I think you and Juan know a little bit about, <laughs> uh, that allow us to start to um, associate information, which means we can start to break down the, the paradigm of content versus data. And, and that's really important when making a decision. How many times, you know, we talk today about fake news, right? We've, we've heard that and I don't wanna get on either side of the political spectrum here, but, but that fake news is how do I trust what I'm reading and seeing, right? So as you're talking about a document and you're reading something and someone makes a statistical statement, 
what's the data behind it and how can I easily get to it so I can be smarter about what I'm saying and reading? Um, we should all be critical that way and, and done well. And with this new technology, knowledge management is less about content or taxonomies, which, which my, my business partner who, who was one of the big names in, in taxonomies would, would give me grief about, but uh, it's, 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 it's more about making information findable no matter what type and style it is. And the cool thing is there's technology that enables it today. And oh, that's sure. not what we've always let, had. Let's dive into a little, let's dive into the whole content part. Is this, because that's kind of a, a loose word here. By content, are you talking about unstructured data documents or you're talking about the context, the stuff in your head or like, what is it specifically? Because for me, I'm gonna say data, I'm gonna be thinking about, it's more of the, or this is my bias here. The data is more of the structured side. Here are the tables. You said it yourself. Like I see a graph, and I want to see the data supports that. Mm -hmm. So what is it? What do you mean by content? So so content is what we typically call unstructured information, right? It's text. It's it's often buried in Word documents, uh, PDFs. It may be maybe on web pages. It may be uh, Twitter feeds, etc. Right. Now it's funny as you say. You know we talk about unstructured versus structured. And I've tended to stay away from that because the second we get uh, these, this content, the first thing we're trying to do is add structure to it so we can work with it. At the end of the day, everything needs some level of structure so that you can analyze and, and do things with it. So is that text analytics pulling out people, places, and things? Is it metadata and taxonomies? Whatever it is, you're adding structure so that you can start to look at things in an aggregate or sum summary method and, and content. So, so we are talking about things that lack the kind of structure that databases have that we're gonna try to add structure to. So I, I guess it is, or well, at least from my view, it is an ultimate view that all organizations wanna integrate data, but this word data here is really, not just what you would expect, your, or what, at least where my head goes into the structured relational enterprise data, but it's actually all the content, right? The things that are in, in, in your documents and stuff like that. So the ultimate view is to be able to integrate your unstructured data and your semi-structured data, your uh, all types of data, no matter where it comes from. That's the ultimate goal here. And I think that challenge too, because that's not an easy thing. <laughs> no, and, and it is. So, you know, Juan and Tim, we've worked together on the data side, our, our company, but when we do the KM projects, we say, hey, we wanna, we wanna mix data and content. And they go, oh my gosh, you can do that. That's possible. Like that's the nirvana for the KM people is, is pulling those two together. And, and so finding ways to um, associate uh, content, which typically is context, right? So you have these great databases with all this uh, transactional information, uh, summarized analytical information. What's the context? What's the feeling around that? That's, that content gives you the context. When you can pull it together and associate it with the actual data, then you have just incredible information that allows people to make smart decisions. So it's like when you, here's this data analysis I do, but then there's somebody who actually writes a description about it. And, you read the description like, oh, I get it because I read the description, right? Not, you don't get all the detail. I mean, the details are in the data, but like the, the broader view of it is because the natural text that somebody wrote around that. Yeah. You, you know, I, I think too, I was working with a, a large European bank just last week and we were talking about this very thing and, and they, they said two things. One, they said, when we build reports that we then share with others, it's really important that people can quickly find the data to understand it, which I, I, I talked about earlier. But at the same time, they said for them, this was their data department, they said, yeah, data's become different now. In other words, we're supposed to report on trends in the, in the environment. And so we're starting to try to mine social media. We're trying to find what people are doing because it's not enough to see what, what happened historically. We wanna see what's going to happen in the future and mm -hmm. looking at that unstructured data, that social data, that social information becomes incredibly important. So even hardcore data people, and, and I'm not as much so you two are, um, are starting to, to come around to, I want that unstructured stuff too, because it gives me vision and future. 
Right. So, you know, just diving into a little bit this, uh, you know, knowledge versus data or the content versus the data, even a little bit more here, you know, why, why is there such a separation or has there at least traditionally been such a separation? Like, uh, just, uh, you know, I remember personally, I, I used to work at a company called Highland Software that does like mm-hmm. document management. Mm-hmm. And then later in my career, I joined a company uh, doing like uh, more BI analytics on top of big data systems like Hadoop, which there was an unstructured component there, but ultimately you were putting everything in Hive or something like that, getting back to structured mm-hmm. again, right? Uh, and those two worlds felt so separate and so different from each other. Um, you know, why Why has there historically been such a separation? And, and to add to that, like e- even the communities, uh, the conferences, like I have never been to KM World. And I know that's a huge thing, right? That's where, that's a conference that you go, you guys probably hang yeah. out. I go more to Enterprise Data World, right? And all these other ones, like, and, and, and there are a few people who overlap. I mean, you overlap there, I've seen you. But w- why are these communities so separated? Yeah, well, you know, and I, I think it comes back to, it comes back to technology. Uh, and Tim, Tim, I think you said it best. You worked for a document management company, right? It used to be, and, and it's funny that there was one side of the house that was managing content. It's web content management, document management, maybe headless CMSs, right? And it was all about text. And there were a set of solutions that supported that, including taxonomy management systems. In the data side of the house, you always had, well, I've got my data lake. I've got, you know, all, all these, all these different, to- I've got Hadoop. I, I, I've got all these tools for processing structured information. And naturally organizations put different people on it. That person that was working on content management was different than the person working on data management, right? And then what was funny to me is, and, and we've seen this so often, we ask people about metadata management. And the data side of the house starts talking about something as if it's totally different than than what what the what the content side of the house. They're going, oh, we need taxonomy management tools, et cetera. And then the data people are going, oh, we need a data catalog and we need this and that, right? And and at the end of the day, metadata is descriptive information about what you're looking at, right? It's like two parallel universes talking about almost the same thing. Absolutely. But they had different words, different people, different tools, you know, evolving in parallel almost, right? And, and metadata being the common thread that kind of binds it all together. I, I, I'm, I'm loving this. This, this is the thread that, that connects these two worlds, right? So mm-hmm. first of all, we should acknowledge that there are these two worlds, right? There's the world of the content of the unstructured data. There's the world of the, of the structured data. They live separate. Um, we would like to go combine them, but they are, I, I, we don't see this a lot in the enterprise, I think. I, I, mean, I think the folks who are combining these two things are, are very small companies. I mean, there's the Googles of the world who are probably doing this stuff, right? Who are definitely doing this, but I mean, kind of enterprise companies are, are, are not there yet, right? If we talk about search, for example, you'll have search over, un, uh, there's more search yeah. about unstructured data, but you don't think about search over structured data. I think it's ch- changing BI is changing a lot of well, stuff. Well, yeah, like yeah. things like ThoughtSpot, ThoughtSpot and that kind of thing are kind like of, that. they're messing up the mold a little bit, right? You're kind of like, oh, weird, like searching your but, data now maybe is more but of a I thing. Think, but yeah. I, I think at the end of the day, when you have, uh, we acknowledge that these two camps, what connects them mm-hmm. are, is metadata. And there's still kind of this, there's still, again, the irony, there's still language barriers, metadata barriers to understand that we're still talking about the same thing, right? Your taxonomy here is your business, your data dictionary over here, right? And guess what? You guys definitely need to be talking to each other because then we start doing them. We're using the same words to mean different things and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, to me, what really finally solved the problem and I think organi- companies are starting to get it now is the knowledge graph, right? These graph databases, their sole purpose is to relate things. So we're no longer tied by, well, well, my tool doesn't support what that is. It doesn't support the structure of, of, of documents or, or data, right? What, what these knowledge graphs are doing is saying, X and Y are related and this is why they're related. And wow, all of a sudden, it doesn't matter what the format is. It doesn't matter what, what the source is. It's just about saying, how do we relate these? How do we, how do we provide context around this information so we can give it back in an aggregated format? And, and 
to me, that that's for actually this is for us. It hit about three years ago. We said, oh my gosh, this solves the content and data divide. I, I, my honest, no BS definition of a knowledge graph is that you're integrating knowledge and data at scale. Mm -hmm. And you want your, the real world concepts and the real world relationships be first class citizens uh, yeah. within your model, how, about how you think things. Uh, and I think that's, that's when, when you start thinking about it that way, you say, oh, it doesn't matter if I get my data from, again, data here, data knowledge just become all connected. It's all one. It doesn't matter. There, yeah. There's no need to separate it, It's them, all right? information. It's all context, right? Absolutely. And, and yeah, these are. These are things technology didn't support before, but it does now, and we all have to grow from that. I mean, from enterprise knowledge standpoint, we created a separate practice, which is our uh, data and information management practice. We call it the DIME practice. And their sole purpose is when we work with customers, help them s solve that content and data divide. That, that's it. That's what they do. And it's because it's so important right? It, it just makes a huge difference. Data isn't enough and content isn't enough. Together, you have something that, that really provides context and meaning and allows people to make smart decisions. This is, this is super, super interesting. And I love where this conversation is going. And, and so you brought up knowledge graph, right? And, and, uh, and obviously, that has been a new technology enabler that's really kind of changed what's possible here. Um, there's a lot more from a tech perspective, right? Though there's like, uh, you know, natural language processing. There's, you talked about taxonomy management, obviously ontologies are a thing, right? So like wondering if you can dive a little bit more into, into the state of the tech, like, you know, what's the state of natural language processing and like, uh, uh and, and taxonomy management and some of these different things, are they, uh, you know, are they mostly front structured? Are they kind of for both unstructured and structured? You know, what, what's your perception on some of these key technology enablers? Yeah, so, so let's talk about the three of them, NLP, natural language processing, um, taxonomy, and then ontologies, right? Because they're all important and they're all a little different. Um, the exciting thing about NLP is it's everywhere. And it's, it's as, as technology matures, it commoditizes right? It's easier to get. And when you think of NLP, every one of us can pick up a Python library that, that allows you to do some level of NLP. So what we're seeing become is- very accessible more, now, right? Yeah, it's, it's easy. Nowadays. Um, and, and now it's about what is it doing? And, and to me, a big piece of it is extracting people, places, and things, right? Get me are, are those a th entities? We hear this a lot, but is that like the most, the three most important things? It's well, it depends what you're doing, right? Um, I, I've started to break it into NLQ for natural language querying, where you're trying to understand intent as you're asking questions. But when I look at NLP, often what I'm doing is I'm taking something that lacks structure and I'm pulling information out of it, right? And I'm pulling out structure by saying, oh my gosh, this is a person. And or, or this is, maybe this is a plant in my organization. And by the way, now I have a whole data about what that plant's doing. So I've got a report about, potentially there's a report about problems from the plant, right? Or issues they're experiencing. And I can now, when I pulled that plan out from that textual description, I can now align it and associate it with the data that tells me how the plant's doing. Wow, now I've started to pull things together that I would never have seen before, right? Um, really important. And, and, and I always, for me, one of the guiding principles of my career has been a, a, an article from, from Harvard Business Review called uh, IT Doesn't Matter. Does, does anyone remember that? Um, what, what, what they said, it, it was this big, well, IT matters, it's a big thing. Well, what they said is, once someone gets a piece of IT, everyone else goes and gets the same solution, and then it's no longer a differentiator. And they said that the organizations that use IT efficient, effectively do the cutting edge stuff that gives them an edge, gives them an advantage, right? And of course they used a, a critical thing to do that. For me, using NLP and associating it with data gives organizations access to information that they wouldn't have otherwise. And frequently it's future state information. Where are we headed? What's the market scene, right? Uh, worked with a very large hotel chain and they were actually 
um, reading tweets about all of their hotels and looking for negative tweets, right? Mm -hmm. And then seeing if there was a pattern and then using that to proactively reach out to their to the hotel owners because it's a franchise, right? And say, we're hearing a lot about your hotel. Is there something we need to do, right? This changed the way they did business. And guess what? There was no information, structured information they could use to get it. They had to create it. And NLP enabled that, right? So, so for me, NLP is changing, changing the way we look at unstructured information. And it's doing it now in a way that's more, more uh, affordable than ever. I, you're, 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 the point, you're making this point that's coming to my head here is that you may think you don't have data, but actually the data exists, but it just doesn't exist structured. So then you can actually get that data such that you can actually kind of be, uh, do your analysis on it because you want to do your analysis on a structure. You derive your structure so, out of the instruction. I, I did not, like I had no data that. to know that this hotel franchise yeah. particular was doing bad. I didn't, but the company does not have it at all. Within their barriers, that, company, that data did not exist. Outside it existed, first of all. Second, it's in an unstructured way. But then you can do stuff to that to bring it in and then tie it to other stuff that you know about it. So I, I, this is super interesting to say that to think about you don't have the data, but it's probably somewhere and you can actually bring that in. Well, and then you start to think about chaining these things together, right? Like OCR, optical character recognition, feed that into the NLP so that then you get your entities, right? Like, et cetera, right? Yeah, really, you know, so so if, if you're a data and information geek, it's fun stuff, right? Like. <laughs> How cool is it that we can go do this stuff and, and find, find information? And now all of a sudden, you know, when we talk about context, you now have a hint that this hotel is having a problem and you probably have the data that says that their revenues are going down, right? So you have the structured data and you have the unstructured data and they're coming together to give you information that allows you to make smart and efficient decisions. So... Uh, maybe not as, as cool and cutting edge. Let's talk about taxonomies. Not that they're not cool and cutting edge because we live and breathe <laughs> taxonomies. Internally, we actually have our own taxonomy university that people graduate from. If you look on Twitter at EK, you will see people in a graduation hat saying they completed their taxonomy <laughs> training. Um, taxonomy uh, is a lot about coming up with a consistent way that people look for and, and speak about information. And, it, and it's funny, I'll go back to a project we did years ago when the company first started, because I was part of it. I don't, I, 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 I'm involved in delivery, but not in the same way anymore. But mm -hmm. we were working um, in, in a large federal organization and we were doing the document management system. They were doing uh, the data to decisions group. It was, it was all data, data centric. And we said, well, we're going to go get a taxonomy about how, how the how the how things are spoken about and the data to decisions people said you guys are idiots you need to get started and i said no we're going to do this first right um, a year and a half later the data team found that they were getting data feeds from 14 different regions and in this case it was an organization that supported other federal agencies uh, each region for instance if they were talking about the department of energy they would call it Department of Energy, DOE, potentially a subgroup within the DOE, right? And so when they tried to do reporting at, a, at, a, at an aggregate level about everything that was happening with this organization, with this agency, they couldn't. And all of a sudden they said, hey, do you know anything about agencies? And we said, well, we created a taxonomy that was a list of agencies and, their, and the organizations beneath them so that we can roll it up. And, and their head said, oh, that would be helpful. So this is where taxonomies start to pull together and, and solve some of the problems that both data and content have. Wouldn't it be great if the way we talked about people, places, and things was consistent everywhere? I bet half the people on this call have dealt with that joy of integrating data from multiple sources where it is not consistent. I see a thumbs up, so I'm going to take that as at least one, but I'm going to say that's half because that's probably close enough. So this is this is interesting. So are you, are you saying that the way to start to connect both the unstructured and the structured is start with the taxonomy? I, I think it's a huge piece of it. Absolutely. It's the way that we speak in a consistent fashion 
And, and that's hard. Uh, you'd be amazed how difficult it is to get a large organization to all agree on what words they use for things and how they describe things. I, mean, I always say it's like, even if we don't come to agreement, at least we know we've cataloged them because we sometimes don't even know what are the different words. Let's just start with that. Right. Absolutely. And, and, and closely connected to a, the idea of a glossary as well. Although obviously a taxonomy is a, l- a little bit more specific, right? Um, so how, how about ontology? Let's go to the ontology. I want to get yeah, how does, that, how does that fit in and, and, and what's the state of that? So, so the aha moment three or four years ago was, oh my God, these knowledge graphs, they allow us to mix this stuff together. They solve the problem. So I came from it, you know, one, you and Tim come from it from the data side. I came from the, from, from more of the content side. And I said, oh my gosh, this is it. Um, when we talk about knowledge graphs, if you think of in the database world, you think of ERDs, right? This is the, my data structure. This is how these things are related. When I think of a knowledge graph, what I start to think about is how are things related? And, and to, that's, that's an ontology. That's how we, how we look at and perceive information. But to me, what takes it even to another level and, and what I love both on the data side and the content side is um, we all think about information based on relationships to each other. Uh, Juan and Tim, I think of you as those people that work at data.world. You think of me as that person that works at enterprise knowledge. These are relationships, right? Ontologies are about defining those relationships and, and, and explicitly stating what they are so that when you build that first knowledge graph, and we've seen it because we've done uh, 40 or 50 large knowledge graph projects, um, we walk in and someone says, yeah, we tried this and it was a disaster. Well, guess what? They <laughs> They didn't take the time to figure out what are the important relationships and how do people, places, and things relate to each other. So that ontology is defining that structure in a way that's repeatable, that's scalable, and that solves business problems. So, so let, I, by the way, Joe, I told you 30 minutes fly by, right? <laughs> we got, there's still a couple of things I want to go cover. And, and one of them is people, right? We Mm-hmm. We're talking about technology, we're talking about these things of ontologies, taxonomies, NLP, all that stuff. But the people, what, what's the state of people here? Because first of all, do we have enough people educated about this stuff? Uh, within organizations, like how are they, how, do we have these types of, of ontologist taxonomies? Should we be hiring them more? Should we be educating more for this? Like, what is the state? Like, how do we actually bring in all this technology within an organization? Because it's not just a magic a magic wand and the bring by technology and you're done. There has to be people involved here. Absolutely. So, so my, my little sales pitch here, and I guess I'm not allowed to say this, but uh, we have a lot of ontologists. So you, sh- you should hire EK enterprise knowledge, but that's probably not the answer you're really looking for. So that's let me, not the answer I'm looking for because you're being <laughs> yeah. um, I'm okay. salesy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll back off of that. Sorry. Uh, couldn't resist. Um, but uh, no, uh, in the same way you have information architects in organizations, et cetera, uh, you, you need to have ontologists. And the fact that they aren't out there. So you got to train them. You got to teach them. You got to find them. Start with data scientists, start with taxonomists, try to grow them. I've seen a lot of taxonomists quote themselves as ontologists, but they're not. So, so you, you, you really that's a, need to- That's, a, that's a, a, a no BS statement right there. Mm-hmm. there I like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what everybody's listening who uh, <laughs> I probably upset a bunch of ontologists who think they are. <laughs> well, the ontologists on this call are like, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So actually I've upset no one because they have no idea I'm talking about that. <laughs> but I am. All right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you need it in an organization where it sits is interesting, right? This is that that age-old conundrum of what happens in organizations for enterprise level initiatives. More often than not. Everyone goes, it's not mine, and IT gets dumped with it. So I see it frequently in IT, but I'm still of, of, of the mind that either a strategy or an enterprise type division is, is one that's important with it. Some of the clients we've worked with have divisions that are information focused divisions that whose role is to make sure information is available. That's a great place for an ontologist. Of course, if you have nowhere to put them, they're probably gonna land in IT. Uh, nothing. I love IT. I'm 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 a tech person myself, 
but it feels like that's not the right place. It just happens to be the place that crosses all the so other. Where, so where should they land? And, and, and let's go into, so what's your perspective about the organization? Because I, I mean, we, we talk, we, we've talked a lot on the show about data teams, data product managers, knowledge scientists. Stuff. How do you see the, 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 the organigramma, like departments, how, does this, how should this be organized? Well, in, so, so I, I have some real thoughts on this that are biased from my CAM, right? CAM is about breaking down silos. And you have a marketing department, you have a sales department, you have a manufacturing department, you have finance, right? What's the department that talks across all of this? Yeah, which one is it? Well, right now people go, well, it's IT because they deliver all the technology for it. Is that fair to IT? No. No, they're trying to deliver technology, right? Not data. They're, they're, or data, yes, they're trying to deliver data. That to me, uh, there's a need for a strategy department, which some, some companies have moved to, but there's also a need for an information management organization. Put this in that pulls it together. We have some uh, phenomenal clients who are really succeeding because they have that information management division. And, and it, it's small, but it's a group of people that say, we're going to break down your silos. Who do we're going to make this organization more efficient. Who do they report to? A CTO, a CIO, a, a, a CDO, a CG? Should the CDO be the CDKO? Or, or, or there's a chief strategy officer? Who, I, who should the, I, I'm liking this. this inf so you're calling it an information architecture department. Yeah. Or even no, information, information, management. Management, information yeah. management department. Information management. They should be under which office? So why is it chief data officer? I'm going to put this back. I, I will tell you that Mohammed Osser said the chief data officer should be the data entrepreneur in your organization. Yeah, really like that. It's it's it, it is you know we think of chief information officer as the person running IT, so maybe that's not the, not the right term anymore. It's kind of kind of been polluted in that sense. This is this is about someone whose role is to make sure information is available to all the people that need to do their jobs, and if it's the chief data officer, let's not just call them data, or if we do, let's redefine what data looks like, right? Because data and information is is cutting across both to do all it. All right. So are you proposing we, we have now chief knowledge chief knowledge officers? Chief. Uh, I would love that. Unfortunately, the chief knowledge officer, which we see a lot of, tends to be really content centric. Right. right? People. I, it it has a it has a, a right. reputation which, which I don't think is fair, but it, it is what it is. So. I, I feel like I want to loop this back to a comment that you made about like uh, that book and like IT, you know, going away or, or, or not being what it's supposed to be. Like, if you think about like SaaS and the advent of like IT no longer having to play this critical role of sort of like running the data center, or, like running the sort of the infrastructural backbone, right? When you take those jobs away, you know, is maybe the future roadmap around IT is that it really is kind of becoming the the knowledge office, the information office. Is that is that the roadmap? Is that where it needs to go, right? So, so Tim, you're saying the chief information officer should be focused on delivering information, not infrastructure. Is that controversial? Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just, all right, all right. I I think this is. This, is this, this our is, honest no BS this is uh, honest bomb no BS. here? So, so, CIOs, you should be delivering information not infrastructure not anymore. infrastructure um because you know what the i and cio actually means information yes it does and that's a good segue to our, 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 our a little segment here on our honest no bs lightning round lightning round uh -oh. so we got a couple of questions for you yes or no answers we'll give you a couple of seconds to give any context if needed but all right so first one ontologist do companies need them yes or no yes that was an easy one, but <laughs> any, any quick quick context you want to add to that? Yeah, um, think of it. You have data in transactional format. Who's going to convert that? We, we've spent years doing ETL to kind of convert it to something that's meaningful. Um, if ontologists that are good model data so that it matches the business, and by the way, they also help that with the content side as well. So they start to turn it into modeling the business, not taking data in the structure that it's in. Mm. Interesting. All right, here, a uh, second question for you. Unstructured information is the biggest area of untapped data-oriented business value. Oh, 
Absolutely. What is it? Um, I think the stats, and we, we quote this all the time, 80% of the content out there is unstructured. The information out there is unstructured. And that's growing faster than the structured data. And we talked about it. When you go back to, does IT really matter? That, that article, which is kind of a principle of my career, uh, a lot of people can work with structured data. I won't say it's easy because there are challenges with it, but the organizations that really differentiate themselves are the ones that can start to pull information outside of their, their box in, in, in the grand world and take advantage of it to make strategic decisions that put them ahead of others. So unstructured is, the goal is to make unstructured structured, but doing that is a differentiator. Yeah, mm, that's a good one. So another question, knowledge graphs will become the central hub for knowledge management. I, in my mind, they are. I don't know that everyone's come there, but for EK, when we walk in, we're talking about aggregating information. And actually we've started a new kind of pitch about what we call Enterprise 360, which is the idea of seeing a 360 degree view of an employee, 360 degree view of a product, 360 degree view of your clients or customers, right? How do you do that? It used to be, oh, we, you know, we pull this together. Guess what? Knowledge graphs are great at that. And they do it in a less expensive way. What if you could see everything about any of these entities in one place? That's why we've that's why I've been calling them uh, the identity graphs. It's like you want to be able to understand the uh, I have a graph about this thing, and then the set of identity graphs start connecting them all together, become your knowledge graph. But all right, Tim, your final mm, question. Yeah. So yeah, you know, we separate from this podcast, have talked a lot with you, Joe, about search. Uh, and so this last question, although we didn't end up talking about it today, is a sort of a nod to that. Is search the top use case for knowledge management? Um it, I, I won't say it's the top use case, but it's the one that everyone asks for. Hmm. So we do knowledge management strategies for large organizations around the world. And I have yet to see an organization that didn't say, I need a better search, right? Hmm. And, and, and the issue is we talk about making information more available, right? Uh, who doesn't go to Google to ask a question, right? Why can't you do that internally? And the searches that have been built historically are horrible. One of the things we've found is that if you integrate a knowledge management, or, or I'm sorry, a knowledge graph, which adds context and relationships into a search experience, you're really solving problems. You know, what's right? funny is that uh, sometimes when we're searching for our own documentation for data.world, we actually use Google to search our own documentation because Google does a better job building their knowledge graph around our docs than the docs portal does. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Tim, T, 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 Tim takes us away with takeaways. All right. Takeaways. I'll start us off and then I'll pass to Juan. So, you know, uh, I thought this was a great conversation, Joe. We hit a lot of different topics. Uh, some of the top notes I have are, first of all, you know, uh, the definition around knowledge management, right? Organizations have tons of information, documents, data, policies, context. Uh, knowledge management is about people, process, and content with the tech, to get the right information to people at the time of their need, which I thought was an interesting way to combine a few sort of angles and, and have sort of a comprehensive definition there. Um, the second thing I wrote down was, uh, as, you were as we were talking about the tools, talking about uh, you know, data management versus knowledge management, you know, I started to think a little bit, I just wrote down data management has this concept of data modeling, knowledge management, you know, you think of like, what is the, you know, data modeling for data management and what is knowledge modeling for knowledge management? And I know Juan's talked about knowledge science and knowledge engineering. You know, you look at things like taxonomy management, ontology management, NLP. It's interesting to think about the parallels here of these sort of like uh, parallel universes, right? I like that you mentioned natural language query as something separate from natural language processing. I've been looking for a way to separate those two terms, right? Because everyone says NLP, NLP, and sometimes they mean one and the other. NLQ versus NLP makes so much sense to me. I'm going to be borrowing that, by the way. Um, and then finally, you need ontologists, and often you need to train them. Because I think a lot of people, like, they want to find some ontologist or maybe somebody who claims to be ontologist. They want them to join their company, and they're like, oh, my God, how am I going to steal an ontologist from Facebook or something like that, right? It's like, dude, no, train them, teach them, right? I got, I got so much stuff here. So I have, one, we have to acknowledge this divide between content and data. Content, you're unstructured and data, you're structured here. Uh, we need to solve this content and data divide. Um, 
your definition of metadata. I took a lot, of, a lot of the things I took away are these definitions. Metadata is just description about the information you're looking at. I love a very simple definition. Metadata is the connection between that unstructured and unstructured, right? That's the thread that starts connecting these two things. And to be more specific, it's about the taxonomies, right? Which are this mix of business glossary. I mean, in some places you call it business glossary, in other places it's called data dictionary. Guess what? It's all metadata. Let's go start, to, let's start together. NLP, it's getting structure out of the unstructured. And it's also a way to generate more data you think you didn't have. Taxonomy, start to solve problems that, uh, start to solve the problems between the structured and the unstructured and start to figure out how to speak in a consistent fashion. Ontologies, how are things related? Define relationships and explain what they are. And the knowledge graphs are the connecting the unstructured and the structured world. And finally, where should all this live? In an information management department. And hey, remember CIOs, uh, uh, you are there to manage information, not just infrastructure. Joe, to close up, final here question for you. Last two questions. One, what's your advice? Broad question on purpose. And second, who should we invite next? Uh, yeah. Um, so on, on the advice question, um, you, you, know, you know, never stop learning. I've learned more in the last three years than, than I ever learned before. And, and I think what I've noticed both for our consultants and, and for myself personally, um, if you're learning, you're trying new things. If you're trying new things, you're struggling at times, right? You're making a difference, but it's always challenging. And if you treat everything as a learning experience, it will be a positive environment. I think I read an article once that said the happiest people in the world are people that look at life as a learning experience. So, so that's my uh, 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 thought there. How's, how's that sound? Love it. Never stop learning. Yeah. So who should we invite next? Uh, so I have a guy that I think would be wonderful for you. He is, he comes from the data side of the world. His name's Mike Ferguson. Uh, he is in, in, in England, lives in England, and he's the CEO of Intelligent Business Strategies and just very bright, very smart, and has spoken on the data side of the house for years. So uh Great, great person uh, to, to chat with. And I'm sure he's going to have some real interesting insights if, if you want to bring him in. Well, Joe, thank you so much. We went uh, much longer than we usually do, but just because, I mean, it's a testament to this is such an interesting conversation. Uh, Joe, thank you very much. And next week, uh, we'll be here with Ashley Kramer. She's the Chief Product Officer from SciSense and talk about the future of BI. Joe, again, thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. Welcome. Thank you. This was fun.